Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to TwitWow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. And this is our Lucha Underground Review. And holy hell, what an episode of Lucha Underground this was tonight. Some major revelations, some amazing matchups, and this was episode 20 of season 2. That means there are only six episodes left, if I am correct, of the season. Man, and this one was a sheer barn burner. Partner, what would you think of it? I love that in this episode, we got a true flip-flop. We started with a cinematic, and then we got a match, and then a cinematic, and then a match, and then a cinematic, and then a match. Yes. All right, no, you know what? There were two matches that happened without a cinematic between them. But for the most part, for the most part, we did a good flip-flop job. But more importantly, all three matches were great, and all three cinematics that we got tonight were amazing. Yes. Yes. So freaking good. And, I mean, with that said, no wasted motion. Let us get right into our Lucha Underground review. And, of course, we do the obligatory recap that highlights all the stories that are going to be touched upon in the night. And then we have a scene in Dario Cueto's office. And, partner, take it away. What would you think of this? Well, Black Lotus warned Dario that El Dragon Azteca Jr. was in the the area where he keeps Matanza locked up. And she said that she stopped him from doing anything, but that she was starting to wonder why she stopped him. And if it was true that El Dragon Azteca, the original Dragon Azteca, was really the one that killed her parents. And she told Cueto that if it turns out that he lied to her, he would have to face the wrath of the Black Lotus Triad or Trinity. It was Triad, right? Triad, yes. And then Cueto told her, that she would be facing El Dragon Azteca Jr. in a freaking match for the first time Black Lotus wrestles at Ultima Lucha Dos. Yeah, so, I mean, Ashton, again, I have I have three questions coming at you right now. One, how do you feel about Black Lotus's debut match being in an Ultima Lucha? Two, how do you feel that the opponent is El Dragon Azteca Jr.? And three, more of a narrative question, more of a speculative question, Oh, what about this Black Lotus triad? What do you think the deal is with that? I think the I'm going to answer your questions backwards, by the way. I think the Black Lotus triad is one of the more intriguing things that have been brought up on an episode of Lucha Underground because I legitimately don't even know what to expect. Like, a lot of the time, when they say gods in the form of man, you know what they mean. They mean guys like Matanza who just happen to have gods trapped inside them, right? Exactly. But when they say Black Lotus Triad, I have no clue what that could mean. Is that three tribes? Is that three people? Is it even exclusive to being a three of something? Maybe the Triad used to be three, but it's evolved since then, and it's more or fewer than that. I don't know. I'm, I have no clue what to expect from this. Okay. And uh, the second question, the fact that it's Azteca Jr., maybe... He'll get inside her head and convince her that Cueto was lying to her? I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know what to expect out of that, but I know that at the very least, if the uh, Lucha Underground writing staff and, and the, the bookers and the agents don't feel 100% confident about Black Lotus in the ring, I don't know if you could have put her with anyone better to kind of help her into having an amazing match than El Dragon Azteca Jr. Right, I agree with you there, definitely. And as far as Black Lotus's in-ring debut, it's about time. What else can I say? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I even said on live reactions, we know uh, certain viewers of the product, like Face Lock Feminines, has got to be elated because I know they always push for the women to be featured more prominently, and Black Lotus was a big question mark for a lot of people. It's just, to me, like, I'm happy about all this, right? This isn't me about to come out with negative comments. It's just, it's really surreal, right, that her debut's added Ultima Lucha. That's hype. Like, that is a lot of pressure, and I think it only further exacerbates the intrigue. Like, what is Black Lotus going to bring to the table? 
Like, I, I am just salivating to find out because you, you have Ultima Lucha as the stage. You think about the freaking story that Black Lotus is a part of. That's huge. And then El Dragon Azteca Jr., both narratively and, you know, literally, as far as just, like, workers are concerned, ha is an amazing opponent for her debut. Like, so much bearing on her shoulders. And I look forward to seeing her carrying it with ease. I just don't know how she's going to do it. And therein lies the intrigue. This is an amazing segment. Yeah, man, exactly. This was so revelatory. And there was like, the thing is, it was like just a 30 second thing where Cueto was just like, you're going to be facing the Dragon Azteca Jr. And the whole thing with the triad, it was 30 seconds. And we have so many questions coming out of it, right? Right, exactly. I it's mean, certainly, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So, what came after this, bud? After this was our first match of the night, which specifically began with Melissa Santos attempting to introduce Marty the Moth, and she it was Marty the Moth, oh, <laughs> because he was, like, touching her and grabbing the mic, and she was just really grossed out, and she wanted to get the hell out of there. So, Marty grabs the mic, and uh, he, he starts calling for kill shot, a kill shot, and he's, you know, like, eyeing up the dog tags and he hangs them in the corner the way kill shot normally does and kind of eyes him up and keeps calling kill shot. And he, he, he kind of gets in the ring and, and he keeps on calling for kill shot. And next thing you know, kill shot shows up and holds the gun up to the back of Marty's head. And just one of the coolest, just imagery moments of the season. I thought these guys work so well together on that psychological level. It's not even that they're in ring chemistry in terms of, you know, workers is like off the charts because, I mean, we did see that one match and it was really good. But I just feel like from a mental standpoint, the, the two characters that we're dealing with here are such great compliments to each other because each has their own kind of mental trauma, but it manifests itself and it expresses itself very differently between the two. And just seeing these two, you know, wage war over custody of these dog tags, ownership of these dog tags is just really quite a sight and it really isn't even that much of a match so much as it is a brawl you know a fight and it ends in a double count out and i mean i think you really said it best on live reactions action the sense of urgency that Killshot displayed the desire he displayed to get back those dog tags was palpable yeah he was so desperate for him exactly and ultimately, Marty does get the better of the exchange. I mean, I, I actually thought Killshot had him secured at one point because he hits one hell of a penalty kick right in Marty's face. Uh, but it only got him back temporarily. Soon, you know, Marty regained him. Yeah. And he, he walked away with him. And the look on Killshot's face, it was a mixture of fury and just agony that he failed again. Yeah. Uh, because we know what those dog tags mean to Killshot. So... I mean, are we thinking an Ultima Lucha match? Winner gets ownership of the dog tags? Like, what are we thinking here with this story? I don't It could be one of the early night Ultima Lucha dos matches. I'm not sure. I I feel like that might be something that blows off in the next three episodes. Or maybe they'll add something to it. Like, maybe we get somebody, you know, maybe Mariposa gets involved and helps Marty. And then Killshot has to find somebody to help him out or something like that. Maybe we get, like, a mystery partner for Killshot. That would be interesting for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. I got to say, too, while we're on the subject, I just got to praise Marty again because, I, I mean, oftentimes I, I've said that I think he's one of the best heels, certainly in Lucha Underground, I'd say in all of wrestling right now because he's a different type of heel. He's not one that's super aggressive like most. And as far as, like, the more monstrous, more dark types, you know, it's not digging into any supernatural elements or, oh, my God, look at this strength or this and that. It's just purely psychological with him. This is a deranged and disturbed character, but it's never hokey to me. Yeah. I, I, I never think that Marty is, like, being a caricature. And I have said oftentimes on my Twitter, at John underscore Twitter. Well, again, the he's just an actual psychopath is what it comes down to. Yeah, he's an actual psychopath. And, and what's so chilling is it's so believable because that really is what we see – in the day-to-day, -day. you know, this isn't some kind of fabrication you'd see in films or novels. I mean, this is as grounded in life as you can get. And I still really believe he is in, in my top five, uh, you know, list of guys that is a future Lucha Underground champion. His character work is exceptional. Yeah, I, the, I feel like the only really character trait that you would see in a psychopath that we haven't seen from Marty yet is word salad. 
Yeah. Like, if we get a good word salad segment from Marty, I'm done. Yeah, absolutely. That said, up next, this segment, man. Mr. Cisco is cuffed in an interrogation room. And Officer Reyes and Officer Meehan walk in. And Reyes tries to kind of play good cop and get, you know, hey, man, we can we can get this. We can get this going. We can be fine. And he gets spit on. He gets spat on, whatever it is. And then Officer Meehan, like, shoves Mr. Cisco on the shoulder. And he's frustrated. And then Captain Vasquez walks in. And she starts listing off Cisco's crimes, including accessory to murder, I might add, and tells him, you know, I uh, I could I could have you put in prison for life. I could put you away for life. And then we kind of come to the conclusion that you can either wear a wire or rot in jail. And she said it's uh, it's a lot bigger as far as Cueto's charges because she wants basically she wants Cisco to sell Dario Cueto out. And he's trying to figure out, like, why do you want Cueto? What did he do? And she brings up, oh, you know, money laundering, drug smuggling, murder. That's a thing. But also, he might, I, I think that he is the linchpin. And then, we, you know, linchpin to what? What are you talking about? The end of days. Yes. What? And it's at this point, you're just kind of nodding along with the rap sheet, like, oh, that's impressive, you know, drug smuggling, murder, we got a badass over here. And then end of day is like, hey, excuse me, what? And you realize, like, Dario Cueto isn't your run-of-the-mill criminal. Uh, I mean, Ashton, what exactly do you think this, I mean, I mean, we can uh, derive from context, of course, end of days, we think, Armageddon. I know you used a term in, uh, in live reactions, you know, you're thinking, you know, biblical proportions here, but... What do, what do you think he's tied in with that makes him the linchpin at the end of days? Is it something about Cueto himself? Is it? I think it might has? have to do with Matanza. I, I it would almost have to, right, because of the god inside him. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you've got a a literal or figurative, or I guess it actually is literal god inhibiting or inhabiting or just possessing your brother's body, that's got to create some kind of an imbalance, right? I mean, you would certainly think so. Yeah. You know, because this isn't a natural state for a god to be in, you know, being a part of or like possessing a vessel, so to speak. Matun's, of course, being that vessel. Um, very interesting here because we know that Cueto is a big time player. You know, we know he has a lot of influence. We know he's a man of opulence and power and all that stuff. That's those were one of the male character traits that you honestly could have established in the first episode when you see how the man carries himself in his office and all that stuff. But then you hear this, linchpin to the end of days, and we knew that there was something darker, more malevolent about the Cueto family history and about Cueto himself. Yeah. But to know that it goes that deep, you know, it, it, it's funny too, right, that he has that kind of power. Because you even think back to the first season, how he would get punked out in certain situations. I mean, Johnny Mundo punching him in the face was one instance. Pentagon looking him right in the face and saying, hey, if I wanted all your ass to me die, I could just break your arm and take him. Like, he is a guy, Katrina choking him. Like, yeah. he is a guy that these people either bully verbally or straight up physically impose their will. And yet he's had this power all this time, which shows me, which is even scarier, that Cueto, and we already knew this, I'm not stating anything new, but he's a man of intelligence and restraint. You know, he's not some guy that's going to fly off the handle. He's very calculated, which should terrify everybody. Yeah. Because if he could have taken care of Katrina and Mundo and Pentagon, but chose not to, what does that mean for everybody when he does decide to take care of business on a wide scale? Yeah. That's terrifying. And I'll tell you what, Mr. Cisco, the whole plot thread with him and Officer Reyes, like, what's that relationship going to become? Because clearly it's frayed because Cisco's thinking, oh, man, I got stabbed in the back by somebody I thought was a friend, but, you know, was really just like a, like a turncoat, a snitch, what have you, and all that other stuff. And the councilman, we still don't know what that's all about. Oh, and the yeah. The councilman, yeah, let's not forget. See, and that's the thing. When you have a bomb drop so big that, oh, uh, Cueto's the linchpin to the end of days, you'd think, oh, man, that's a shit ton of power. So then why is the councilman waiting in the wings? What is that about? You know, something big is coming to a head for Ultima Lucha Dos, dude. I, you know, because we had the five-minute 
kind of outro at the end of the first Ultima Lucha that was so epic and everything. What are we going to get at the end of this season, I wonder? You know, I think what one of the things about the season's end that really does have me the most excited is the prospect of those final minutes where, like, last season we got all this stuff that they were building up for for the season two, and in this case it'll be for season three. Like, that was... There was so much stuff that happened in season one that was amazing, but easily in the top five, if not the top three single sort of moments of season one were those final five minutes of the final episode of the season. And being able to see that at the end of season two, just what they do with this version of it, knowing how well received the first one was, I'm, I can't wait, man. I'm anticipating it so much. And the great news for you, for me, and everybody that listens to this show and is a believer in general, is we can feed off of it until the end of time and get amped up because we know season three is confirmed. So it's not going to be a mixture of ambiguity of, oh, that was epic, and oh, I hope they're able to finish. Like, no, we know whatever happens at the end here, there is going to be a definitive continuation. Beyond that, that's where ambiguity returns. But for now, we can really enjoy this journey, and let me tell you, I'm enjoying every second of it. Yeah, man. Oh, man. I'm so glad that season three is already confirmed. I I really hope season four gets confirmed long before the end of season three. Yeah, let's hope, man. Let's hope. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So up next was our second match of the night, and it was literally a nunchuck match. This was insanity. <laughs> I don't even, I, I, John, I can't even. Dude, what did you think of this match, man? Because, like, nunchucks were everywhere. These, Arrows, these yeah. two were trying so hard to kill each other. It was amazing. Dude, these two teams went at it hard. I mean. <laughs> the thing no is, way. like, and I know that they probably have, like, soft, rubbery nunchucks. But th- just the idea that these two are, and in kayfabe, the nunchucks are wooden or metal or hard plastic. And just the idea that these guys are, are cracking each other in the stomach, in the back, over the head, specifically with Drago and Jack Evans with these nunchucks. Oh God, dude, it was insanity. Again, nunchucks were, we got another dive off the top of Cueto's office too. I almost forgot about that. Yeah. That was Aerostar, right? Yes, it was onto both members of the opposing team, both Evans and, uh, PJ black were the, on the receiving end of Aerostar's dive off of Cueto's roof again. Exactly. And I like the pacing of this match, you know, the teasing for the nunchucks at first. I thought they came into play at a good time. I felt like enough anticipation was built by the time they were introduced. Yep. So, yeah, everything about this match was so much fun and on point. And, yeah, Drago and Aerostar get the win because Drago pins Jack Evans with the Dragon's Tail after a nunchuck whooping. I mean, he put a hurting on that ass. And as I noted to you, uh, brother... Uh, Drago and Aerostar just beat two thirds of the trio's champions. So my question to you, because this has been on my mind for a while, we think in Drago, Aerostar and Phoenix versus, uh, uh, I think world underground is their team name. We call them aerial assholes at Ultima Lucha Dos for the trio's championship. It makes all the sense in the world because Phoenix hates Johnny Mundo too. Johnny Mundo is the reason Phoenix isn't a trio's champion right now because he attacked Phoenix in the back to become the third member of the aerial assholes to complete the trio. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really hoping dude. just a little uh, side thing. I'm really hoping in the lead up to that match, we get a one-on-one match between Phoenix and Johnny Mundo because just kill me. Like it's going (laughs) to be so good because the way Johnny's been wrestling lately, he'd actually win. Dude, we'll get to that. Trust me. We'll get to that. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to say about this tag match, though, brother? No, not about this tag match. It was it was a lot of fun, but there really isn't a lot you can say about something as chaotic as this. Exactly. This was just calamity. It's like trying to do commentary on the Tasmanian Devil. Exactly. Well just, said. All you see is just, you know, tornadoes of dust, and every now and then you'll see a limb. There you go. You just don't know what you're looking at, right? Never. Never. <laughs> so what came uh, after this? 
up next, we got right into the next match, actually, because I remember earlier on I was saying we had a, a cinematic in between every match, but then I realized we didn't because of these two. Our main event was one of the most bizarre matches in Lucha Underground history, and the thing is, this isn't even the first match that involved exactly 12 people, isn't it? No, it's not. Well, technically it is, because the first match that was supposed to involve 12 people ended up only involving 11 because of Angelico's injury. That is true. That but is true. This isn't the first match that was intention- intended to have 12 people in it. Right. <laughs> so that's that's Lucha Underground for you, though, man. They don't give a single shit. No, they do not. And uh, as entrances are being made... Oh, I'll, I, let me just go over the teams. Yeah, right. run down the participants for everybody. Uh, all right, so on Team Puma, we've got Prince Puma, Rey Mysterio, Sexy Star, Tejano, The Mac, and Son of Havoc. And on Team Mundo... We've got Mundo, Taya, Phoenix, Chavo Guerrero Jr., Ivelis, and King Cuerno. And now I remember why I said that there were cinematics in between each match. Because even though it wasn't a cinematic, we did get a talking segment between the Nunchuck match and this match. It just happened to not be a backstage cinematic. It happened in the temple. Yes. In front of the Believers. Yes, and so everybody's making their entrances. Chavo makes his entrance last, and then out of the corner because of our the kid at school, he has to be separate from everyone else. Exactly, <laughs> paid for it later. Yeah. And uh... imagine if he would have come out between Mundo and Taya and the other three. I just want to keep it together while I say the rest because it was just so funny because I'm such a <laughs> sick fuck. Um, out of the corner of our eyes, we see uh, a Pentagon scooter. He comes up from behind and he starts talking and he more or less says, Ashton, to Chavo, in the beginning, you were one of the only people that ever really cared about me and had my back. You supported me. You supported me. Thank you. And then you and I are kind of scratching our heads because us being the Lucha Underground scholars that we are, we're like, wait, I remember the Chavo Guerrero turned on Pentagon Jr. in the first Aztec Warfare matchup. And, uh, you know, so we're thinking, what the hell is this? And then Chavo's like, oh, you know, thank you, but I got to go do this match, okay? And then he turned yeah. and he's like, I love that Chavo was so accepting of it, too. Like, oh, yeah, I know, man. I was so supportive of you. You're right. You're welcome. You deserve it, man. You're really good. I'm going to go do this match now. <laughs> you dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turns around. <laughs> Ashton, you got to do the rest, man. I can't do it. <laughs> and then Pentagon is just like, you supported me then, but I'm going to destroy you now. And he stands up out of the wheelchair and attacks Chavo, chucks him into the ring post, and it doesn't take very long that we see Chavo in perfect position, coincidentally enough, to get his arm broken. Oh, my God. <laughs> Big Cass can sleep at night again because this was so much funnier than when he got his ankle shattered. Oh my god. Chavo was so helpless. I even tweeted later I was a dick to two people at the same time because I'm like Chavo perfected his Vinny Massaro impression. <laughs> he just broke that arm like it was nothing. And the believers loved it. Oh, Chavo's really had a rough go at it lately, hasn't he? Oh, I don't know, man. I mean, he won the Lucha Libre World Cup. That is true. And he was actually a big part of it because he had a steel chair on Pentagon, so like his payback really is a bitch. Oh my god, the timing could not possibly be better of that. I know, right? Because it's crazy, dude, because we know that Lucha Underground's like taped way before the World Cup yeah. even happened. How does that even work out? Did they know ahead of time that they were going to have that happen? Because Lucha Underground's just next level action, but of course, think, look who I'm talking I don't think Triple A even knew that far ahead of time that that would happen. Because that's that's an intellectual trait exclusive only to Lucha Underground. <laughs> that's just, I seriously though the fact that four days ago or or three days ago I guess it was since today's Wednesday three days ago we had Chavo crack Pentagon in the back with the chair <laughs> <laughs> to cost him the Lucha Libre World Cup and now today. Chavo, it's if you think about it as if the the, the Lucha Libre World Cup was a, a, a part of Lucha Underground K-Fame, it makes Chavo's role in this so much funnier. 
Because <laughs> he was just like, oh, well, I'm glad you've forgiven me for costing you the Lucha Libre World Cup. But yeah, man, I was totally nice to you a long time ago. I'm glad we're cool. <laughs> I'm going to go do this match now. Because, I mean, I rarely get to be in the main event, so I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's you in the main event. How about that? What a coincidence, buddy. <laughs> oh, shit. What happened? It's like, oh, God, Pentagon, you could walk. That's amazing. Wait, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Let's talk about the match. We're, we're getting oh. we're getting all kinds of off track. Oh, oh can, I, can, I just, can I just say one more? And I swear it's like a serious point, so it's not even continuing the joke. I just love that he came out on the scooter to begin with because that just furthers again the dichotomy between the cinematics and what happens in the temple because nobody knew that he healed already. Yeah. So yeah. like such a good point. Well, and right. not only that, but I don't think anyone had seen him in the wheelchair before either. Exactly. So it's so like, what is it? Like a shock to the system. Like, Oh my God, Pentagon's in a wheelchair. Is he okay? And then he gets out of it. And it's like, Oh my God, he is okay. And Chavo was probably looking at that scooter. Like what's this? The Pentagon's thinking your end motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. But anyway, the match, absolutely just amazing chaotic every word in the book yeah. what i loved is even before the bell rings and of course we get the whole pentagon situation like worked out because quato actually appeals to the fans do you want pentagon in the match of course they say yes pentagon's in the match um phoenix gets in mundo's face which is great because phoenix is like hey i didn't forget what you did uh ivalice gets in Taya's face again i didn't forget what you did and so we have that tension right out of the gate so I'm glad that they remind us of that just as a refresher because it's going to come up later. Not maybe necessarily in this match, but just later in general. And then you have the match, and it's just great. I mean, we have great storytelling on one end because Taya works the beginning of the match. And who did she start the match off with, Ashton? Was it, it wasn't Puma. I'm trying to remember who she worked it with. but yeah, Sexy Star. Sexy Star, you're right. It was Sexy Star. And then she just kind of is just like, all right, I'm over this. Tags in Ivelisse when Son of Havoc gets tagged on his end. So now we've got Ivelisse and Son of Havoc having to go at it. That was great. Uh, wouldn't take long before the match broke down. And Ashton, we just got the most incredible sequence of dives. Oh my god, there were so many. Like, I would try and go over them in order, but that would require me to actually remember the order that they happened in. All I remember was that Pumas and Son of Havocs were my two favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Then you know, they also I, both happened to be the only people that landed on their feet, so there's that. Yeah, you know why you and I couldn't remember them all? Because our brain matter was all over the goddamn wall with the just insanity of this match. Yeah. Uh, I love to, because I know you, you had a line of the night on live reactions. Because oh. then Ray is going for a dive, and you're like, oh, oh, there's Ray taking the spotlight from the young guys. Like, I wish I had pretzels for just the amount of salt there. And <laughs> right as he's going off the ropes, Mundo grabs his legs and pulls him out. And then you say, with that, Mundo's become my second favorite Lucha Underground performer. And of course, he's just my all-time favorite anything. So I'm, like, creaming my underoos. And then Mundo is about to go for a dive. But then your favorite in Lucha Underground, Prince Puma, kicks him in the head. Yep. And then, can I take the rest? Sure. Because this was just amazing. We get the sequence. First... Ray hits the 619, and if you guys have been listening to Twitwell Live Reactions long enough, and you know that I have a vested interest emotionally as a fan in a match, I get really pissy and salty when I think I know how things are going, so I'm just like, I got my sighing voice on, I'm like, this is disgusting, let's, okay, Ray, you got your 619, let's, let's do it, let's send the crown home happy, because I'm thinking, okay, there's nothing going to stop this, except something did stop it. It's called the ability of Johnny fucking Mundo. Because as soon as Ray, it's like, okay, I'm going to set up Mundo. It's going to be perfect. That 630 is going to be sexy as hell. And then Mundo kicks Ray into Puma, does a flash kick to Ray off the rope, effectively taking out his ass. Flying and Chuck. Then, That's what it's called when Mundo does it. Yeah, fly, they, I, they, I think in Lucha Underground they do call it a flash kick, but I've always loved Flying Chuck because he loves Chuck Norris and, you know, I'm the Mundo Mark, so whatever. Uh, oh, I didn't know that he was a Chuck Norris, Mark. That's amazing. And so he does the flying Chuck, sends Ray out. Puma's still on the turnbuckle, and it's at this point that I'm going, no, my luck couldn't possibly be this good. <laughs> Except it was. <laughs> and it was, though, because Avalanche Spanish fly to Puma, 
and for the first time since the early days of the first season, early episodes, Mundo pins Puma. So let me get this straight. No, because I have to revel in this, because I have waited for this for so long. I have to do it. Trios champion. Still, trios champion. Lucha Libre World Cup winner. And now he gets the winning pin in the main event tonight at the expense of Prince fucking Puma. Who, unlike Cage and other opponents, I have never denigrated because I know what a huge deal that is. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, let, wait, hold on. Hold on. I, I, I'm going to give myself a prostate exam. No, I don't think I have a four-leaf clover shoved up my ass, but this is fucking amazing. <laughs> oh, my God. A Lucha Underground Championship inevitable, people. Just give it to him. Oh, my God. This is great. And, and also, it's probably worth noting that he won the trio's titles and then i i'm trying i think they defended didn't they defend the trio's titles last week yes and then he won the lucha libre world cup and then he won this match all over a 14 day period not and dude not only the 14 day period which is an amazing insight by you by the way thank you for that what's even crazier and i'm not even shitting about this he was a, and I don't even mean like, well, of course he was. He was a part of every one of those things decision wise. Mm -hmm. Got the winning pin for the trios titles, yep. retained them because he was the one kicking the balls for the DQ. Yep. Got the winning pin for the Lucha Libre World Cup on Pentagon. Wow. And then you're so right. That's insane. He's having oh. such an amazing year. Oh my God, dude. If he keeps up on this trajectory, I may be able to put Mundo as my superstar of the year, and it may not be a total fucking cop out of fandom. Oh, like, yeah. Dude, his role has been ins it's about freaking time, man. I'm so happy. And I know it's not going to last. I, I know there's going to be a video where I'm just like, oh, well, that was fun, but I'm just enjoying the freaking ride, man. This is unreal. Oh, my God. I so, love, too, that, like, Lucha Underground and AAA are pushing Mundo at the same time. Yes, because he's taken over the fucking world. And I read recently, now, I don't know, again, whenever I cite things like these, grain of salt, blah, 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 blah. I heard apparently even Vince has interest in bringing him back now. Oh, And I God. read that. And you I can't, love, you cannot have him. You can't have him. Because he's doing shit that you'd never do with him, as in being a main eventer and a guy that's building something. Because you know, Phoenix, I think, is going to get the comeuppance for the team on Mundo that wins the Trio Championship. And that's a great thing, too. What I've noticed about Mundo, because you know when we talked about him, as excited as I am, I always try and stay grounded. I always said that I felt like Mundo, as far as a piece of the Lucha Underground puzzle, was to build other talents. Even the first championship he won was for two, I would say, more organic Lucha Underground talents. Because even PJ Black, I feel like he's making more of an identity for himself here than he ever did in WWE. And he's teaming with Jack Evans and PJ Black. Like, I love that he's helping these other guys and is a part of something like that while still having this phenomenal career success. It's just amazing. I'm so happy. And yeah, fuck you, Vince. You didn't know what you had when you had it. You lost. Get over it. Oh my god, I'm so happy. So... Anything you want to say. I don't think I can add anything to what you just said. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what, brother? Since I kind of monopolized the discussion all that, I'm going to leave you the honor with our closing cinematic, and I want to hear your thoughts because this was insanity. Yeah. I... Closing thoughts? I mean, we haven't even finished the show yet. Well, that's what I mean. Like, I want you to talk about the cinematic since I really talked mainly about this match. And oh, my, my God. Gushing. Well, here's the thing. Mil Muertes, when he used to be, you know, pre-revival Mil Muertes, wore blue pants and had normal colored eyes and had a black and purple mask, right? That's correct. Post-resurrection Mil Muertes wore black pants, had white eyes, white irises, and I think he still had the black and purple, but it might have just been black at that point mask. Right. But now, I don't know what color pants he's going to wear. Hopefully he sticks to the black. I don't want him to go back to the pajama pants look. Right. But he's got red irises now, and his mask has, like, brown leather, like, ties holding it together. Right, right. Which, I mean, it's it's worth 
pointing out that his mask was torn the last time we saw him by Matanza. Yeah, that's correct. So that makes all the sense in the world that he would need something to hold his mask together. And that's probably going to be like a new addition to his attire. And I think it looks super badass. It's awesome. Oh, he looks so fierce, dude. I'm worried for Cuerno. Like, dude, I'm just letting you know right now, if that were me and those red eyes met me, I'd be like, oh, okay. No, I'll just make this easy for everybody. I take myself out of the game. I, I don't give that motherfucker the satisfaction of whatever he wants to do to me. No, I'm out. Like, I don't even know what Cuerno's gonna do, man. That is nuts. Those red eyes were, like, crimson, and it, he wants his blood and the mask. And Katrina, like, where have you been, woman? Are we gonna get answers to that? Like, this was insane. I feel like they got so much done in this one episode. And Cuerno Mil Muertes has to be on tap for Ultima Lucha Dos, don't you think? Or maybe we'll get that beforehand. I was just going to say, yeah, I mean, it probably should be, but there's also the possibility that we get it beforehand and then it develops into something more. I mean, because let me just get this straight for the final time, just because we're so close now. Ultima Lucha Dos is, what, a four-hour affair this year or three? How are they doing it this year? It's like every- four hours over three episodes. It's going to be taking place on episodes 24, 25, and 26, with 26 okay. being a two-hour special. Okay. Okay. So we have three more of this is episode 20 tonight. Yeah, we have 21, 22, and 23, and then Ultima Lucha Dos starts at 24. Okay. So these next three episodes as the lead up to Ultima Lucha Dos, I mean, we already know, and that's the thing, too, with all the craziness that's gone on, let me just uh, commend Lucha Underground for something they did at the start of the show. I mean, in essence, again, we already have one match for Ultima Lucha Dos, Black Lotus versus El Dragon Azteca Jr. Now, the rest of the card that you and I have been kind of spitballing, oh, you know, Trios Championship, you know, Cuerno Mil Muertes, purely conjecture. Because knowing Lucha Underground, we may get that Trios Championship match next week or even two weeks from now. And then maybe either the return match or something totally different is for Ultima Lucha Dos. Maybe... You know, we get Cuerno and Mil Muertes uh, earlier than Ultima Lucha Dos. Here's another question, and a guy I've been thinking about. Actually, two people. The world title, Matanza, where does he fit? Cage, where does he fit? You're talking about a guy that was white hot recently, took Matanza to the limit. And a third question that a lot of people have, and I know we've been two of them, uh, Gift of the Gods, is anything going to come of that either with six episodes left? I, just so many questions, and yet we did get some answers tonight, but I'm left wanting so much more. Oh, my God, this show's too good. It's not fair. <laughs> You're so right. <sighs> so, dude, I mean, anything you want to say about this cinematic, or do we get to our next segment here? What next segment? Well, I mean, high spots, low shots, I mean. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm talking about in the show. Yeah, let's go. All right, high spots, low shots. <laughs> My low shot, even though it's my high spot, just as a sick what? man, Chavo Guerrero. <laughs> <laughs> Get an ice job, Chavo. Get an ice job. Get iced. That arm is destroyed. Shattered into a million pieces. <laughs> just like your hopes and dreams for that temple, Chavo. <laughs> Enjoy the Lucha Libre World Cup, buddy. That's all you're getting. Yeah, maybe that's what you can fill the ice with as you dip your arm into it. Oh, God, my successes, even they hurt. <laughs> uh, Ashton, who's your low shot? Oh, oh, crap, my low shot. I had a high spot prepared, but now I forgot what my low shot was going to be. Oh, kill shot. Oh, yeah, that's that's a difficult one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he did so much, and yet he still walked away empty-handed. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. Like, it's funny because I can laugh at the Chavo one. I legit felt bad for Killshot. That's I want to. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to see him get back those dog tags. So, see, even Killshot has shown that there is hope for me to be a normal human being. So, I mean, that's quality character work right there. Um, high spot, easy, Johnny Mundo. And why? Because in all the calamity that was that main event, he pinned Prince fucking Puma and continues the role of his career right now. It's not even close. Who's your high spot? That was my high spot. Oh, was it? I'm sorry. No, you're not. You're so right. 
All right, my high spot's Drago then, because he finally got the opportunity to shut the Dragon Slayer up and prove that he could slay one by himself. And dude, to kind of add on to your high spot, to kind of accentuate it and show what a great choice. I mean, again, he pinned a champion. So logic that says, too. like, hey. Yeah. I keep forgetting about that because it was like they were in separate matches tonight. Exactly. But yeah, they are. They are trios champions, and Drago got a winning pinfall over one of them. So that could spell big things for him in the future. Exactly. I just got to find a running buddy and be like, let's do this. So, it's yeah. Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix. It's Phoenix. Phoenix. It's yeah, Phoenix. I agree with you. There's Which no is funny. It. Which is funny because they were a team in the first ever trios tournament and they lost. But if they get a yeah. shot, yeah. Oh my god, I forgot about that. See, this is why we're on the show together because between the two of us, we've got the complete Lucha Underground history together. I do stop. But uh, yeah, man, great choice with Drago. Uh, with that said, any closing remarks about Lucha Underground tonight? Mm, other than the fact that it was amazing and that we had three really good matches. Well technically two really good matches and three amazing cinematics. Yeah. I mean, pretty good summary, right? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say it's a pretty good summation of tonight's events. Yeah. So that said, take it home, brother. All right, guys, this has been Lucha Underground. This has been Twit. Wow. The best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today i'm john that's my cohort and commentary ashton guys be sure to comment and subscribe on youtube ashton what question you have for our subscribers this week oh wow well we haven't seen matanza in a while so who do you think his next defense is going to be against and whoever that is do you think he'll win or not excellent question there so who's matanza's next title event's gonna be because remember the road to the first ultima lucha was paved in uncertainty though that was more for contendership than the champion but still you never know what might happen so who's the next title event's gonna be yeah and what do you puma, think? puma when he was champion he had to face all kinds of different people on the way to ultima lucha I mean, that's true, but I feel like also the challenger had oh yeah know, I mean I'm yeah. no I'm, I'm I'm agreeing with you but I'm also saying that there was instability in both the champion and contender spot, but it was definitely way more so in the contender spot. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, with uh, yeah, so we got that. Answer that question. Give us your thoughts there. Be sure to take the conversation over to Puitoff. That is pro wrestling is taking over Facebook. Be sure to give all your thoughts on Lucha Underground there. Start that nice little community there around you. Also, be sure to check out the TwitWow Facebook page. Like, share, and comment on the content there. If Facebook isn't your medium of choice, we also have a TwitWow subreddit where you can find all of our TwitWow content and members of the subreddit can create threads of their own on all things related to pro wrestling. However, for the best possible TwitWow experience, I highly recommend you follow both of us on Twitter. I am at John underscore TwitWow. That is J-O-H-N underscore TwitWow. Ashton is at APON404. That's the letter A. Pond the body of water, P-O-N-D, 404. And we will see you again for our Monday Night Raw review. It is the Go Home Show before Money in the Bank that Sunday. And we will see on the Ambrose Asylum, Dean Ambrose as the host, and the two guests, Roman Reigns and Seth freaking Rollins. It's going to be a Shield reunion to remember, or so they hope. But regardless, you can get your best coverage right here at TwitWow. And until then, tune in and peace out.